Welcome everybody to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Course Pro class. This is the winter spring 2023 class. So this is our final office hours. Um, I also have a new hat, which I thought was fun. And uh, I just came in from outside, so I'm keeping it on. Uh, so we're good. we've got a couple of questions. We've got a question from Dali, and then we've got a question, from, two questions, uh, one question from Dali, and then a major question from Sergey. Hello, Phyllis. Good to see you. And uh, after that, we can have open conversation if you want to talk about anything and everything, or if you want to chat a little bit about your designs, as we're doing a bit with Sergey. So happy to do that as well. So I've got my questions up, your questions up, and I'm, ah, there's Colin. The whole gang's <laughs> back together again. Love it. Okay. So I'm going to put all our faces over here. So, Dali, what are the techniques or methods to reduce and mitigate the risks of the late spring frost? For example, this year in Serbia, we have snow and frost between 20 and 26 of April, most of which most of the fruits were blooming. Similarly, it happened in 2021 and 2020, the most impacted apricots, cherries and plums. Yes, they would be. So let's talk about big picture first and foremost, because we're patterns to details. So when we talk about the patterns to details, it's about understanding the origin of element. So this has been a big conversation of mine. I'm going to put you guys under this screen. So I'm actually looking at the camera because right now I'm not, which is a little weird. There we go. Um, let's talk about origin of element and where different things come from. So one of the things that I think a fair number of people can get into is thinking that we can grow anything anywhere because permaculture, because regenerative agriculture, because biodynamics, because Korean natural farming. That is not the case. And it's a mental falsity that we need to eliminate early on in education. Permaculture, regenerative agriculture, Korean natural farming, any of these isms or ologies or processes or systems are great, but ultimately we're still working within a global blueprint of flora and fauna and evolution. So apricots, cherries, and plums have all grown up in a certain place and a certain way. Now, because of that certain place and certain way, there's going to be certain elements that are going to be true about this type of fruit and how they grow and where they grow. And so one of the things I put in here, and I'm just going to pop it up because I've asked, somebody just asked me to open the door for them. Um, and I think it was, I think it was, which one was it? Was it this one? I had these all up and then I closed them. Yeah. So one of the things to keep in mind here, I'm just going to pop this up as I drop, drop down the keys here, is where um, things like apricots are from and why it's an issue in terms of where we're at. So hold on one second. I'll be back in two seconds. Marco, you're okay. Sorry, get out. Okay, thanks a lot. So when you take a look at where something like apricots originated, Western China, Asia, Iran are characterized by moderately cold winters, short, mild, relatively dry springs and hot, dry summers. So that short winter aspect is the conversation. So if we're ever growing out of the origin of element, this is true for apples, this is true for garlic, this is true for everything. We have to take on the work of that origin of element. We have to basically moderate the climate, the topography, the water, the sun, and sometimes even the biology within the soil. So big picture, let's be conscientious of when we decide what should go where, that we're conscientious that we may be operating outside of that zone. Uh, a colleague of mine used to call it out of zone -onitis, and that many, many people are afflicted by out of zone -onitis. And it, uh, it, it affects, you know, nine out of 10 permaculturalists because there's generally, again, this mentality that with permaculture, you can do anything, which is not, which is not true and not the case. So with that said, uh, we go back to existing uh, conversations, existing pieces with fruit growing and fruit growers, of course, have a vested interest. This is always the case. If you're looking for good solutions, look for 
conventional practices that have an ecological mindset. And one of the things that came out of the organic fruit growing, uh, fruit growing industry was that if we have a, a light thin spray as we move down to and below zero Celsius, out in the orchard, either above tree or below tree, we can either moderate the temperature below the tree enough to not warrant the expense and the cost of overhead spray, which is much more intensive, but much more effective. So that's possible. The problem with that is you have to keep spraying through the entire freezing conversation because basically you're taking up the energy that would have necessarily gone into the freezing. So basically the water freezes instead of the blossom because if the blossom freezes, you lose, or if the young fruit freezes, you lose the fruit. The other product, which is phenomenal and works really well, is KDL, which is basically potassium bonded to dextrose and lactose or corn syrup and milk sugar. And basically it's a spray similar to what you would be spraying through irrigation, but what ends up happening is it bonds very quickly into the sugars of the flower and the fruit and basically creates an antifreeze that uh, resists the freezing of, of what is either a short or prolonged frost. Um, it's generally quite cheap because the ingredients are quite cheap and can work really well uh, over, over a longer period of time. And there's also uh, recipes that you can find on the internet to play around with the ratios and whatnot. Um, AgroK basically developed this put it together and it's a, it's a great application. And so if you're working on the small scale, this would be backpack sprayers. Uh, again, make sure that your backpack sprayers are have not been used in conventional agriculture because chances are they'll, they'll have biocide, insecticide, things of that nature. And you do not want to buy used backpack sprayers from that industry. The only industry I'm, I'm happy to say that um, over the years that I've been fine to, to purchase used backpack sprayers is the, um, is the wildfire industry. Uh, because the majority of those are one very easy to clean, very easy to use, uh, are built to get plugged, and so they're built to be taken apart. And because sometimes the things we spray as uh, regenerative growers and producers can be not perfect for the mechanisms of spraying, um, they can be really great. And uh, almost without exception, there's never chemicals used in those backpack sprayers. They're always spot sprayers for going back and making sure everything's blacked out. So those are the, the big solutions, the point solutions, but generally I would walk yourself closer towards your region. I would take a look at um, heritage fruit or specifics that have been cultivated to work with um, a uh, more muddled winter to spring transition and be conscientious about those. So basically, choosing cultivars that are late bloomers, but still have a shorter season. Does that answer yeah. your question, Dali? Yes, uh, I just didn't think about, uh, yeah, fruit trees origin because it's pretty common. Uh, plums, apricots, uh, cherries, apples, queens are really common in Serbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I learned from my uh, grandpa was not to prune apricots as other fruits. Uh, he, he was calling that uh, prune when it's green, when it's uh, all. So that was work, that works for me for years and everyone were envying me how I have a, a peach, uh, apricots while well, they don't have, but this year and those two previous years, we really have a late uh, uh, frost, which is really rare, usually end of March, but this is like really extreme. And yeah, we don't have apricots. And this year, neither plums. Oh, I'm sorry. That. That's too bad. Yeah. Uh, That's too bad. So, yeah, I really didn't think about the origin of the plants, but. Um, yeah, this might be explanation. Uh, another thing that I noticed on a big uh, orchards uh, here in Serbia, uh, it's that they're using those huge uh, uh, bales, uh, putting them around orchards and then uh, start a fire, but hmm. uh, not to 
burn burn really slow actually mostly produces smoke yeah but yeah. that solution yeah so bit, yeah not so safe for, <laughs> so for there's me. there's other solutions there's there's large <laughs> fans there's uh there's of course uh, the small fires that have been done since time immemorial with fruit trees um there's uh i remember reading a text from rome talking about those the small folky fires and basically what they're doing is they're creating an inversion layer with smoke so that way the 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 cold can't settle into the trees basically yeah. um so so you you in, invert it and actually the the Yurok people of uh northern northwestern california they would do the same thing when it got too hot and they were worried about the salmon uh running they would create these fires when it was a it was a low pressure day so that way that that smoke would come down into the valleys and of course into the rivers and they would blanket the rivers they would blanket the valleys in this this uh, smoke to reduce the heat so that way the salmon could spawn so there's there's a great history of using smoke and and different elements but then the other side of it is you're now building a bunch of small fires usually with whatever you have because you want it to smoke which of course has a particulate emission yeah. and can create air pollution as well so yeah i didn't give you all the solutions because there's many um but these are kind of the small home scale solutions yeah. that i think in terms of energy in for energy out work really really well yeah. um in terms of you know the large irrigation and the large spraying that's a huge amount of time and infrastructure and and all the rest of it and of course the other thing is because it's cold you have to keep that irrigation running consistently because there's the the risk of pipe freeze as well Oh yeah, we have that too. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, when <laughs> pipes, uh, yeah, uh, the the big pipes, uh, for those uh, cities and villages, mm. they were like a meter, meter and a half on the ground. They froze, mm. and ours too here. So yeah, it was interesting, but we yeah. had the snow, and <laughs> we use the snow as the water. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I hope. Jeff, we... I mean, oh, good. You would. You would suggest that you go with a diff uh, a specific species that is in that family, but uh, a shorter blossom and later blossom. Yeah. So if if your winter to spring transition is becoming less and less defined and is becoming more variable, as as many places are, not all, but many, um, I would be conscientious about coming into a place and and this is true for all plants. Go with the winners. Go with the heavy hitters. Go with the things that will make your your homesteading your landscaping your farming boring i.e i don't have 25 different experiments i have a number of plants that i know have a track record of working in my area with buffer and what i mean by that is if you're late frost is sometimes you know april may beginning of june then you have later um later fruit that generally can either resist because of the high sugar content an early frost and fall or has a bloom time and a fruit time that's within your window comfortably. That just means that over time, what will happen is your fruit will be in the safe zone longer, as opposed to fruit that you're having to work and put extension into. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes a lot of sense. And you're right. We're experiencing it more and more. I mean, we had 50 degrees in April and then 32 degrees in May yeah. or lower. Yeah. So just nuts yeah <laughs> and that it's gonna get worse and this is the thing that i think very few people consider is that it's going to get worse and this is one of the reasons why uh, i had a colleague of mine take the uh, advanced climate adaptation i think it's uh, advanced permaculture climate resiliency course with uh, osu and that whole process goes through a conversation of using Copen Geiger classifications, taking a look at the, what the 25, the 50, and the 75-year predictions are through the IPCC uh, 1, A1, F1 predictions. And the A1, F1 predictions are the humanity does nothing. In fact, it probably continues on with its exponential growth of all the things that it's doing that are influencing climate change. And I mean, all the things, this idea of carbon being the only thing we're focusing on is, is as terrible as, as not focusing on the whole conversation because it's a monocrop of metric. But that conversation, those metrics have been proven to be quite accurate thus far uh, because Copenhagen is based upon native vegetation and so as you're watching the native vegetation change the phenology of it basically you're watching the climate change 
And so taking a look at that 25, 50, and 75, that course, which I really recommend, um, it gives you a sense of what is my current Copen Geiger classification? What is it looking like in those future events? And what can I research about those future events or those future Copen Geiger classifications for my site in terms of other places in the world that have those similar future predictions? And what kind of what kind of plants and processes and, and agriculture practices are they working on? And it's a really interesting course. It's something I include in pretty much all my designs now as I take a look at that Copen Geiger, Copen Geiger classification. And that's a that's a uh bum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum, stop share. That is a Google Earth Pro data set, which you can find on the Copen Geiger class or Copen Geiger classification um website. And the way it works is you basically have your your variability up here so i was just doing this for a first nation garden i was designing this weekend and the past weekend it's basically we're designing enough food for 60 elders to feed 60 elders i have to do the math here my brain's having a moment 23 plus 25 is 48 there we go i can do many things at, at once math apparently is not one of them so basically what you're doing is you're making the mark between 23 and 48 and you're watching the change and then you do the same thing adding 50 years so 73 taking it up to 73 and then popping this back down to 23 and then you're starting to see changes again and then you do 75 years um which is 98 which is just at the extent of the range of this current prediction data set and you can see the change in how that warming climate's coming up. And generally in North America, what we're going to see is we're going to see a more humid warming climate between 25 and 50 years. And we're generally going to see, be, see a drier, warmer climate in 50 to 75. So this is a great data set to have and to work with and to use um, and gives you a sense of where you're headed. So that way you can start to prepare if it's of, of interest to you. The other thing I wanted to share um, so I think we've talked about this before. I work in a process called a feasibility study uh, because it takes so much to really understand what we're looking at. And one of the things I pass on to my clients is this idea of patterns of permanence, which I thought would be an interesting conversation here. This was a site I worked for. Uh, it was an incubator farm. I'm going to bring everything over here so I'm not looking to the other screen. So this pattern of permits is based on the permaculture scale of uh, the permaculture scale of, oh no, it's not the permit, it's the <laughs> scale of permanence for all things agricultural, all, all things agricultural uh, created by PA Yeomans. There we go. Woo. Almost forgot. Um, and it's been used by a number of different people. Um, a lot of folks in holistic management use this. The Regrarians platform uses this. And basically when you're taking a look at these different levels in conversation the things at the top are harder to change take more time and energy the things at the bottom are shorter to change take less energy one of the big things that people get frustrated by is that soils down here and sure enough long-term native ecological soils take a long time to grow but in terms of production soils that we're building uh working with uh cover crops working with the uh, biological or me uh, mechanical decompaction working with aerated compost extracts and teas working with uh, grazing management, we can create really great soil in, in a short amount of time. And so generally when I start my my written portion to my clients, I talk about these patterns of permanence because so many of the clients that you work with will say, I want X. And uh, it's your job, I believe, in either if you're using permaculture, if you're using other tool sets, or if you're working in a broader scope like I am in terms of regenerative land design, to be conscientious that the things they ask you may not be possible, which is why I start with feasibility. And so my way of doing that is talking about if something you want in your site doesn't fall within the native purview of all of these different elements, the climate, the geography, the water, the access, the ecosystem structures, energy systems, fencing, fauna, soil, enterprise, or equipment, then it's going to take work for you. And this goes back to our apricot conversation. If you're growing apricots in a place where apricots are hard to grow, you're taking up that work. And so in this example, this is a pattern of boreal forest, second regrowth. And the evaluated decisions was based on a client that came to me was they wanted to create a garlic farm or they wanted to do, or I suggested wild crafted forest products. Because when you take a look at these two options, 
The garlic farm, especially because of the flora and the soil, is so far outside of what you natively see. And this goes back to Sergey's point uh, about how much he loved the biome conversation in the local ecology survey. When you understand what your biome is, you then understand the rules by which to play with because that's what ecologically has been worked upon for years. So if we decide to intelligent design our way into an, an ecological system, chances are we're gonna fail. Um, and so this is just a couple of, of simple uh, diagrams and elements that I present to clients to show them, let's stay within what your, your native ecology is, your native climate is, your native ge geology is, and let's not try to be too, um, fantasy filled when we come to our designs or our conversations. And this goes back, I think, to something I said on the very first call. As a, as a designer, I am an advocate for the land first. I'm an advocate uh, for my client's money second. I'm an advocate for their wants third. And it's one of the reasons why people enjoy working with me because I am doing what I think and my experience has trained me to understand what the land natively is trying to do and become and all the rest of it with the implications of there's humans on there and they want to uh, grow or be or be present. And then off of that, let's make sure that your money's going in the right place. And then after that, let's make sure underneath those two umbrellas, how much of that client want actually fits underneath those umbrellas and to be conscientious about that. And um, it's kind of, Kind of a wonderful place to be because you get to tell clients, no, your road design while being straight and beautiful and having rows of trees because you read a book when you were five about what a farm was, looks um, colonial and like it should be on a magazine. It runs through two watersheds and it disrupts the flow of animals on your site and is going to take a huge amount of time to maintain. So just be conscientious about this idea that we need to work within the ecology that we find and not force function a pattern inside our mind or as happens so often in, in, in permaculture courses, you get taught a number of um, elements. The, the major offender for this for me is the herb spiral. And basically you walk through the permaculture store and you grab things off the shelf and you just plunk them onto a landscape. That's super problematic and something we all need to avoid generally in life so we can find a good fit, a good conversation with uh, what we're looking at. Does that make sense to everybody in terms of either the Copenhagen classification or this idea of um, patterns of permanence or the permaculture or the, <laughs> uh, the scale of permanence for all things agricultural? Does that make sense? Are there any follow-up questions to that? I do. Could you yeah, go please. back to the, the, the graph, the, the, what you just, where we just were? Sure. So is this a real case or a customer that you're working with? They wanted a garlic farm, but you're recommending a wildcraft forest product? Years ago, yeah. Oh, years ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As, as was so it hard to sell them on it? I wasn't hmm. selling them. See, this is the thing that's interesting about the way that I approach this. I'm not selling anybody anything. I am taking the conversation that's in front of me and trying not to argue with the reality of what I see. And arguing with that reality is you can do whatever you want. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be quick. It's going to be easy. That's a lie. That's a, that's a fiction. So my approach was they came to me and they said, we want to start a garlic farm because we heard that garlic is a value add product. It's easy to turn income on it. And uh, it, pretty much everyone can do it. They're right. Low skill. Totally. There's skill to it, but generally it's, it's very uh, forgiving to a new grower. Generally, there's a large market for it. There's multiple markets. There's um, seed garlic. There's culinary garlic. There's value-add products like garlic chutney, black garlic, garlic powder. And generally, that appetite is not inexhaustible, but very large, especially when you start working in seed garlic and direct selling to, to places that don't take into account the types of funguses and the types of blight that can befall garlic. They basically just plant garlic the same way they always do. And they always are importing garlic, especially from Canada into the States. It's one of those, those nice income sources that Canadians can, um, can explore. Uh, so in, in my situation, I wasn't selling them on anything. I was saying, you hired me to take a look at your land and to, to, to see if this was possible, because that's what I tell people. I start with a feasibility study is what you want feasible on your site. And usually we'll end up with a concept plan and this 
massive document. This is 170 pages, which is basically a handbook for your site. What does this look like? That's regenerative land design. Within regenerative land design, what I do, permaculture is a certain portion of that. So there are elements that I'm talking to you about now that I think are useful if you want to go into this, but are definitely not within the massive umbrella of permaculture as it was taught by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. So with this, I basically sat them down and said, you could deforest this beautiful block of land. You could slowly renovate that soil to go from a bacterial fungal ratio of you know 10,000 fungi to one bacteria to uh, like a 1.52 fungal to bacteria. That's possible, but that's work. And though these are the conditions over here that make garlic farming successful from an ecological perspective. And these are the conditions they had. And so when I sat them down and said, I think you would be better if, if you're interested to do wild craft forest products and probably work with forested animals like pigs, chicken, or goat. Like these are these are the elements. You purchased the wrong piece of land to do this type of application. And this is why I get a lot of people who come to me before they purchase so I can evaluate different types of property for their ability to produce what they want because they're thinking about production. I just got an, an, an inquiry from um, India then they're looking to do a farm and I'm currently trying to explain to them everything you want may be possible, but our first step is to evaluate if it's possible and especially because their conversation is about skilled labor and if they can bring the laborer on and train them and all the rest of this. So with these folks, I sat them down, said, here, here's what I see. Here's what I understand. Here's what I think about this landscape. Uh, we did a vegetative walkthrough. I looked through their landscape. I was like, there's a fair bit of wild crafting that could happen here. It's going to take more labor for sure. But in terms of like the daily labor, the, the grind labor of actually maintaining the conversation, but it'll be much more pleasant. Um, and generally what you'll do is you'll get into the medicinal aspect, which they wanted to get to eventually, but wasn't what they were doing initially. Um, and if you do want to take out, you know, a small swath of trees, and these were tall trees, right? Talking about a boreal forest, it's hard to get that solar landscape perfectly. So you can get the warming of the soil, which garlic needs, the finishing that it needs, the dryness that it needs, because of course, forests are more humid. Um, and so ultimately what they decided to do was sell the land. Um, they decided oh. not to do that. They decided to hold the land because it was during that big rise. Um, they decided to hold the land. I think they made 10 to 20% on the land and go actually get an agricultural piece of land. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that they didn't get rid of the forest. <laughs> Me too. Me too. And that's, you know, this is the fun thing about design. If you do decide to go into this work, you know, if, if you're somebody who can tell some, tell a client, your downspouts have no bottom jets that have no, no bottom push that puts that water away from the house, you potentially could save them a basement. You know, the, the return on energy investment for an intelligent designer who can look at your site and go, huh, there's water and there's water near your house and your house is something you want to keep. And water destroys things, usually uh, elements that are of high entropy, high organizational capacity. You may want to change that. A client of mine once, um, once called back years later and was like, <laughs> that one conversation has saved me more headaches than probably anything else we did, like the rest of the landscape, because I got deep into water when I started, just understanding it, understanding its flow, its conversation. And I was always very aware of it. It was just a side comment as I was doing a walkthrough with this client. And I was like, huh, do you have issues in your basement? He's like, yeah, it's always musty. It's like, you seeing any mold? No, but I'm starting to smell it. It's like, Maybe you should put your downspouts not draining into your basement because on the outside, right? So it's uh, it's important to be conscious of the different elements that influence a site, where they flow, what they're doing. And this is that conversation of energetic flow. What are the energies that flow onto the site? And what are what is the interaction of those energies on site? And then as they flow off site, what happens as well? And then being conscious conscious of, amplification, deflection, you know, that conversation about that sector analysis. I think a lot of people dismiss the sector analysis as just being a, oh, that was an okay assignment, whatever, it's no big deal. It's essential. Like once you understand what's affecting your site, you can start to work with it. I just met somebody yesterday who was new to the tropics, had never grown here before, and uh, was trying to figure out why there's no, why there's no nutrition in the soil. 
And it's one of those things that if um, you're used to uh, either a temperate conversation or just not thinking on a global ecological scale, the nutrition in tropical climates is in the air, i.e. vegetation. It's in the animals. It's in the diversity. All that gets pulled from the soil. And so generally, tropical soils are highly depleted. This is why terra preta or biochar was developed in the Amazon basin. You know, you get a place that's one of the most biologically diverse places on Earth, but the soils are depleted. Why? Because it's the most biologically diverse place on, in, in the planet. And so they had to create a way, a coral reef to hold biology, to hold minerals, to hold water in the soil. And so they settled on, you know, low to slow oxygen burnt carbon that becomes crystalline carbon, recalcitrant carbon that can stay uh, it's it's crystallized carbon for somewhere between five and 10,000 years. Fantastic. So being context specific is, I think, the main takeaway here. Great question, Phyllis. Great question. Any follow-ups either about this or the Copengeiger conversation before we walk on to Sergei's terraces, both mentally and figuratively? Just smiling faces and Colin's name. Okay, cool. Let's do it. So you are a gem. I just remembered that I left that to you over there. Every, every time, man. Every time. Okay, so. Oh, that mate is strong. If I get more excited throughout this next five minutes, you'll know why. Okay, so Sergey's got a great question. And I, again, patterns to detail. We're going to go big to small. And uh, I just want to say I've really appreciated this core crew uh, of this class. It's been really fun to have these office hours. I'm going to miss you, miss you folks. So I have a question following up on my rainwater overflow management in the blueberry groove terraces. Uh, terraces will be on contour. Grade in the terraces will have a very slight angle lengthwise. So by that, I think you mean in terms of lengthwise, it's going to be graded this way or this way. Is that right, Sergey? If you're talking, I can't. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. yes. The idea is for them to have a little bit of a so that the the next part works. So there is a little bit of a gravity fade. Gotcha. Okay. Um, overflow with the northeast corner goes into the existing underground drainage pipe, which daylights at the north edge of the hill. Idea is to do a reverse French drain, connect that pipe into a perforated drainage pipe wrapped in landscape cloth and covered in drainage rock along proposed northwest terraces. Switch to non-perforated between terraces to keep the proposed dry walkway and actually flow that water to the next one, totally. Remaining overflow will be released onto a flatter part of the hill, check dam needed, uh, added if needed. Part of the hill near the crest are about 30%, going to 25% a bit lower. I think it's too steep to build open swales, hence the idea with the drainage pipe. My reservation is long-term viability Soil will eventually fill in between drain rocks, water release rates. Um, another concern is that enough water will seep out of the pipes to irrigate the plants. Even a chat bot won't calculate for this for me. Uh, yeah. Do you have an experience with something like this? Funny enough, I do. So let's talk about this. So Sergey's got this great, uh, great site and he's got this steep section here. There's some great photos he gave us. Um, actually, there's some great photos in the, uh, just below he just put in here. So this is the steep section, and then these are the terraces. Is that right, as I understand it? Uh, correct. The terrace is not exactly mathematically where, you know, they're approximately where they will be. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Everything has to be ground truth day of, and you basically source and work with it as is. So a couple things to think about here. First and foremost, is the water going there because it has no other place to go, and this is the overflow you want to send it to? Or... Are you trying to create supplemental irrigation and supplemental water for what you want to grow there or both? I think it's both. Uh, that uh, it's an old house, so it's built only four feet away from the property line. So there is not much room uh, uh, to do any storage okay. of you know, any like meaningful capacity. Um, I'm thinking of adding one uh, 250 IBC toad as just kind of like a first fill um, and to use, uh, you know, in the area if needed. Sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, you know, there's potential of get, getting rid of, there is a deck, under the deck I can put storage, but I'm using it for both. So, um, and it's uh, very, you know, there is no way to redirect that water on the roof to go elsewhere without like 
ugly piping through the middle of the windows. Sure, sure, okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, the uh, the soil here is fill uh, from, you know, this hill is artificially constructed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so there is a lot of sand, so it drains pretty fast. Uh, so my concern is also, you know, um, extra moisture for this, you know, for these plants. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so there's a couple of great points here. Um, now with sand, uh, that kind of brings up a good a good piece to think about right away. With sand, chances are you're you're going to have to reinforce the terraces in some way, shape, or form, either with wood or with urbanite or rock or something. Um, if there is quite a bit of sand, and depending on the size and the scope and the scale, you create them. Uh, just the angle repose of of sandy soils is going to be uh, problematic. Um, yeah, and... I'll, I'll be using the uh, cut up uh, cement driveway to build. Okay, so the urbanite. Gotcha. Awesome. And then are you are you wanting sight lines down the hill or is it all right if it becomes vegetated? Um, is that all right or what does that look like? I mean, uh, on the actual terraces? Yeah, like is there a view quarter here? Let me grab. Yeah, uh, so the there is a, where you see the fire pit, the red thing in the middle. Yeah. So this is like, yeah. Um, and these uh, three long pieces that you see laying, this actually eight by eight, it's kind of like a, step down area to look at the creek you know, yep. the water is around there so yeah i'm putting taller species towards uh my neighbor to the top so there is the cranberry and high bush blueberries but then i'm switching to low bush blueberries so and and like some uh, smaller lingonberries and uh a couple of small pollinator fg uh and G dwarf for for Siglia, which elder, okay. which are only about four feet. So yeah, I'm keeping those few sheds. Awesome. Uh, and just for everybody who's watching, my thinking process is when we get to a place that's um, has quite a bit of of potential for erosion, if we can't back the terraces with something like urbanite or something else that will retain them, I start thinking about live staking. I start thinking about live staking with willow, red oyster, dogwood, and alder, but they grow big. So that's the question about the view corridor. Um, so basically what we have for everybody that's watching, we've got this northwest corner. And the idea is, is there some way to kind of keep the water moving and in this slope uh, it's actually water coming from uh, from the upper right corner from the house through. The oh, it's from the house area. itself, and then it's basically going to to pond it's like, down. It's going yeah. to be conveyed down to the the north side. Is that right? Yeah, there is there is this uh, under the like proposed part. Of, there is already drainage. Uh, oh, okay. The gray, the gray arrow underneath, like that's the drainage pipe coming, and right gotcha. now it's daylight near this VC. Gotcha. So yes, there, there are ways in which to calculate this conversation to understand what the flow is and what the, the main event flush will look like. My experience with this is generally what we do is if we are bringing the water into a, a, a pathway or a, an area, um, generally we're only going to get somewhere in the order of like 10 to 20 feet of flow especially with a perforated big O pipe, depending on if you're using the three, the five, or the six with its perforated pipe and then its sock cover. Um, generally, that water is going to flow out. And if you have something like sand, it's going to dissipate quite quickly. So the idea of keeping that piping going all the way down, I don't think will bring the water down. We could run the calculations on it, but in thinking it through in my experience with sandy soil, I don't think it's going to be... Um, it's going to be necessary. I think you'll get some flow on this first conversation um, in terms of its first terrace. Probably what I would do because you're working in sandy soil is I probably would develop or, or put into this something like if we're working with, oh, thanks for that. If we're working with a terrace like so, I might actually put uh, like a hugel trench close to the toe of the slope maybe not mound too high because mm -hmm. it's just going to lose 40%. And then what I might do is put that big old pipe in the first conversation. Uh, definitely in hugo culture, you want it to be above 50% in terms of where you put it. You don't want it to be dead center. You want it to be a little high um, and probably run it, you know, halfway through this 
Uh, and then you've got that whole hookah culture that's basically going to be uh, a core precipitation uh, holding capacity over uh, what might be a drought period. And I'd probably do that on all of these kind of back into the toe of the slope is put something like that. I just don't think you're going to get the run out of water that's going to actually come down. If you're worried about that, what you could do is you could pipe, um, this is called uh, wood piping. It's kind of a cool uh, thing I learned about from David Polster. Basically, you can create pipe drains with wood buried in the ground. And he did this in a number of places where he was doing steep reclamation. And so if you have these hookah cultures that are basically benched from place to place, and I'm going to switch to my um, switch to my line tools to kind of make a three-dimensional conversation here. So say we've got our, our hoog there. Like this, and like this. Okay. So basically, if we've got our hoog culture like this, and we've got all the wood, and orange on orange is a bad call to show this. So if we've got our wood that's on this back side, uh, what you can do is you can basically, with this mound, you can run a pipe drain, which is basically a bunch of wood that's you know two, three feet down. It's basically the same height of this. But basically, you're, you're putting the soil back on, and this becomes a connected conversation to the next layer. Um, the, the other option is, is you could daylight it, but generally who culture and daylighting don't work well together. It ends up becoming uh, rodent habitat and it becomes problematic. So what you could do is you could have, you know, your hoover culture here, you could have your pipe drain that comes down and then comes down again. But I don't think it's going to get to a saturation point where this is actually going to be necessary. It would be something that let's say you were in a, a wetter environment with a more um, water holding soil. I might consider, but if you're sandy soil, if you're a sandy soil, I don't know I would do that, but I just wanted to show that it was possible. I think that's probably what I would do, Sergey, if I was in okay. your situation. All right, and uh, uh, so long-term, you know, the hugo culture will you know, turn into soil and then I will have a pipe coming from the house underground and then, uh, you know, the water, won't have that busway. Well, it will. Like basically, once you have high water holding capacity soil, um, that wa high water holding capacity soil will become like this refuge, this sponge. So basically, it will take up as much water as possible. It will soak up that water, and then it will release slowly, and you'll get this bioturbation effect around that soil lens, where the area around it will slowly build an organic matter because where there's water, there's life. So if you still have that pipe going into that area, either 50 or 75 or 100% of the length of this, that top terrace, I would predict, would be the most productive of your terraces. What that might mean at that point is um, you may want to think about or work with something that uh, takes up more water. And you may see that the vegetative needs you're seeing overwatering potentially, but generally you're not going to see that because the water itself is going to be subsurface. It's going to come from the bottom up, which generally creates stronger, healthier plants. I, I don't think I would see that up until, even if it did happen, it would have to be year six or seven, and you'd have to see probably 110 to 160% um, increase in the record rain event. Uh, and at that point, you're going to be worried about other things on your land before you get to that terrace. And I, I will have about uh, 800 uh, square feet of roofing kind of going towards this pipe. Okay. And have you run the calculations on uh, your 15-minute rain event through the uh, other course yet? Yes, I did. Um, I'll need to find another. As you're looking, I'll just let everybody know. Sergey's also in the rainwater harvesting design and implementation with Gord Baird course. Um, where we go deep into calculations and understanding what that first flush might look like coming off of a roof. And the reason why I'm asking this question is um, sizing that pipe will be important in terms of what's coming off of that root. Now, if you're using a three inch, there may be an issue with sizing. If you go to the, the five or the six, there'll be no issue whatsoever. It'll, even if it flushes out, it'll be easy to flush into that terrace. The other option that you could do if you wanted to purely focus on um, building organic matter and didn't want to go to the effort of the hoogle, is you could do a day lit uh, 
rock trench in the same position. So basically that rock trench, I'm gonna go back and then show what this might look like and then use the eraser because I don't wanna lose the terrace. Oh, I did. See, And so basically what that would look like is a rock terrace, or pardon me, a rock daylit path would help to bring that water. So let's say that pipe still comes in like so, and then goes all the way down to the edge, but then everything within that trench, I should go to the tool. So this trench here is basically a, a, a rock just filled with probably inch and a half, inch and three quarter crush. Um, that water will basically find drainage down through here, but generally you're gonna lose the majority of it because there's nothing actually to hold it. So this would be a slower process that would build a little bit of a water lens around the trench. So there'd be this little water lens and that's where you'd start to get life. Reason why I, I generally in the temperate environment lean towards hula culture is it will, it will develop water holding capacity quite quickly as will terraces in the long run. Sepp Holter would be very angry with me if I suggested combining terraces and hula culture as would Zach Weiss. But in your situation, I think it makes sense because that, that soil is so sandy. The other thing I would do is I would try to backgrade these swales in your situation. So instead of being, um, let's say at a, at a 90 here, I would probably go to like an 85 or somewhere between 85 and 90, just so that way it has a little bit of water capture at the back here naturally. Sandy soil, you're not gonna get much of it, but it will also help with the, the settling as it goes throughout. Did you find that volume, Sergey? Yep. Uh, so I have uh, um, one minute and twenty-four hour and twenty-four hour minimum. Okay. Uh, so for twenty-four for that section of the roof, it would be about uh, four thousand gallons. Okay. And uh, what's the what's the coefficient on the roof? Is it point nine? Uh, it's eighty. Yeah, it's asphalt, so 85. That's okay. including, the, that's past coefficient. That's already, you know. Oh, okay. Great. So 4,000 and with that soil load. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that terrace will be able to handle that quite easily. And you probably won't. The run, hold on, let me take uh, 25 feet. So, yeah, it's probably like 25 to 30 feet, this first terrace. Yep. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yes. Something like that. Yeah, I, I would say that first terrace is probably going to take that load First. Yeah. as a dynamic load pretty quickly. And then there's going to be very little that's going to come off into the second one. You could. You could plumb in the second one just as a, as a, a potential, but it's amazing how much the soil can, can absorb, especially if it's hydrating like, like sand is. Yeah, I don't know if I would run the pipe all the way down. I don't think I would. All right. Yeah. And I can, man, I can always like leave a connection and then uh, always dead end and then always it feels like it's waking up and you know always and to go. Hundred percent. Yeah. Easy enough to do. Yeah. Cool question. Thanks. It's nice to work on stuff like that. Uh, any questions from anybody else who's watching that and having any thoughts or queries or anybody want to comment in? Like I had a follow up a little lower, um, in mm -hmm. potential like answer to this, but this like the the idea of sending the water first to the bottom one, and then have the water back up into the uh, upper drain. Yeah, it won't do that. It won't it, do that. With the, with the soil you have, it won't back up. Got it. No, I think what'll end up happening is even if you get a you know you know, half fill, the way that those those big old pipes are created, I don't remember what the total drainage um, conversation is or the percentage drain is, but it's high. Like the whole point of them is to bring water in and release water. And so it works 
really well to get rid of water. And sometimes what we're doing with it is the opposite. We're actually wanting to convey water quite a bit further. So I don't think this will happen. I don't think you'll have that bottom that will build um, build up and then back up. I don't think we'll see that. Because uh, yeah. basically once that gets to saturation or field capacity, well, it's open. That's the other thing. It's, you know, French drains usually have uh, piping within them and then they have rock around them as well. And when we take a look at um, capillary action, which is adhesion and cohesion, you're going to have that water fill. It's going to fill up the big pore space. This is one of the funny things about French drains. It's going to fill up that big pore space and only until it gets the saturation will it then start to release into a small pore space soil. soil yeah. Right? Um, which is a funny conversation because of course it's, well, this is the drainage. Well, it works kind of and it works pretty good, but it's it's still that conversation that it has to get to field capacity. It has to be saturated before it'll till before it'll pull out. It's the same conversation about rocks in the bottom of of flower pots. Your soil has to get to saturation before it will give water to the rocks in the bottom because you're going to small to large size. Mm -hmm. So similarly, I think in this situation, you're not going to get a backup and it's not going to come up to the next one. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Good, great, great conversation though. Thanks for this one. That's awesome. I'm going to check the old chat. Nothing in the chat. All right. Well, we are getting to our first or final couple of minutes here. And uh, I, just, oh, good. Jen, sorry. Um, I was just wondering about advice on incorporating volunteered plants into designs, um, as Andrew Millison called them in one of his videos. Um, I uh, recently uh, decided to attack the invasive bittersweet that was really coming from my neighbor's yard. Um, and I have the poison ivy to prove it. And um, I found mulberry and blackberry and all sorts of like different little guys that I'd love to help along. Um, and so it changed my zone one design, um, which is why it's, it's not in yet um, because I decided that I wanted them to come along. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, what what your advice on, on it. They're currently in the midst of because of the bittersweet dying pitch pines um okay and i think that that they're gonna you know the pitch pines aren't long for this world um but i do want to sort of encourage the mulberry i think i have red and white and mm. the blackberries that are creeping up and i think there are several rugosa rose so yeah i'm just sort of letting them do their thing obviously right now i don't yeah so your question is when you find volunteer plants what to do with them or yeah. And like how to incorporate them and how to ensure that, you know, if you have, if you did decide to, to, you know, incorporate your volunteer plants, how to help them in the most, you know, I don't know, structured way, I guess, sure. with, like within the larger plan. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, a nice problem to have, or, or as I learned long ago, this idea of, you know, a non-problem, it's a, it's, it's a bonus. It's, it's something that actively is there. And uh, it reminds me of this design I saw. It was, it was a design that Sepulter did in like the late 80s, early 90s. He did the design. He put in the terraces. This was in the south of Austria. Um, he put in the terraces because he saw the trees and he figured the trees that were back graded would catch and hold the nuts that were planned to be planted there. And it would become a nursery. It would become a, a no work nursery which when I saw it, which was like 20 to 30 years later, the client went into receivership. They knew that Sepp had designed it. They reached out to him to see if he wanted to buy it. He bought it for a song and now it's called the Holzerhof. This is the farm that he and uh, Veronica live in the south of Austria, closer to Italy. Whereas the Kramaterhof is their original farm, which his son Joseph runs. Um, and it was just that. It was this amazing site that caught nuts and grew nuts. It was just, you know, the large nuts were creating more nuts and it became a nursery potential. So one of the things that that story and that experience of being on that, that place always made me think about was where in our site does life actively just want to be created? And what kind of plants just natively want to come up? And so generally when I see that, I try to work with what's there and I try to incorporate that into my design. So recently I was in, I was working on a design in Southern British Columbia, same idea, kind of toe slope, 
Northwest Valley goes into a creek. So creeks down here, they have this big long slope or this big long plateau that's their site. And similarly, like right at the toe of the slope, you're seeing all of these, these, it's this young little nursery area that constantly comes up with a higher stem per meter or higher stem per acre count than you would normally see in in, uh, in the, that type of ecology creating. And so one of the one of the economies I was talking about on site is you could run a very small native nursery, uh, like a zero work native nursery. It's basically you dig up, you pot up, you sell, or you do uh, you dig, which was the idea that I eventually settled on is you want native trees? I got native trees, bring a shovel, um, which is the lowest work you could imagine. So in a situation where you're kind of more in an urban environment, you're seeing things like mulberries and I'm partial to mulberries. So I'm going to try not to uh, be biased, but I am. Um, I would basically allow them to continue to grow and be very observational about why are they growing there? What are their growing conditions? So I wouldn't necessarily, and I don't mean this derogatorily towards you or humanity at large, but I think it's a good word, meddle with that type of growing and just be conscientious about everyone, turn off your phones before we begin class. Javin, turn off your phone. <laughs> um, and just be conscientious. It's kind of like a little zone five in many ways. It's like, oh, interesting. This, these species want to grow here. Why? You know, look at the water, look at the climate, look at the shade. Usually th those types of species are gonna grow in a little bit of dappled shade. Um, so just being conscientious of that. And then if you want to start playing the imitation replication game, like where else on my site could those potentially grow? And if there's multiples, I might transplant one to another site, another area, and be conscientious about transplanting and just watch and see what it does and see if that actually, because that's, Steph has this wonderful saying, um, the book of nature is always open uh, for humans to read and eventually reread when, not if, they don't read it properly. It's always there to go back, go, oh, that's what you meant. So I think that conversation really applies to finding volunteers and um, allowing them to incorporate. One of the things that we found with composting, it's this conversation about creating leaf mold. Leaf mold is when you take all the leaves in the late fall, take a piece of stucco wire, make like a big old, you know, meter, meter and a half, four, five, six feet round, pile them up with, um, with leaves and let them decompose. Leaf mold is incredibly great for starting plants, incredibly great for incorporating into soil, but generally you can grow squash in it like nobody's business. So you usually use that to create squash, usually create that, you know, create these conversations. And it's the other thing you'll find this as well, that compost pile, when you think you've messed up all your plants and you throw them into the compost pile and the compost pile goes, I'll take care of them. And all of a sudden they start popping up or you start seeing, you know, that conversation. And so it's one of the reasons why and I really appreciate Sepp's approach to this, he broadcasts seed. So he broadcasts on terrace and he broadcasts on hugo culture. And so basically you take a, uh, a number of different types of species, annual, perennials, early, mid, late growers, and you broadcast, you broadcast in aggregate. So you put them all together, conscious about big seeds versus small seeds because big seeds will throw farther. So basically you split them up into kind of small, medium and medium, large groupings, and then you broadcast. And then you let nature tell you what it wants to grow there. And this is the way that I've worked with a lot of my hugels is I haven't told nature what to grow there. I've just populated it, usually after a stale seed bed conversation with the tarps and everything else, and just saying, okay, what do you want to grow here? What I don't want to work against you. What's here and how can I populate this in a slow, easy fashion that requires less and less effort for me? I like annual garden. I like sort of the... Jean-Martin, um, Market Gardening, Zach Lokes, uh, Permaculture Beds, Curtis Stone, Spin Farming, like that's all great. And if you're doing high production, you're trying to feed a lot of people, kind of like what we're doing with the Honey Wetton people in Northern BC, there's going to be that. But I'd love to have these larger hygge cultures, big, like actual sized hygge culture, two meter tall, meter and a half deep, you know, three meter wide, that can become these little ecosystems that every year you go and you bless the beds with the seed heads of kale and parsnip. So this is a technique I picked up from a buddy of mine, Brandon Bauer. 
the end of the season, he would take all the the big seed heads and he'd go around and he would bless the beds with them and he would shake out the seed and he would prep those beds for the next season with parsley and parsnip and daikon radish. And, you know, he doesn't have to do all the seed saving. The plant does that. And then you go and you shake, shake them on all the beds. And that then creates early food for everything. Everything has early food, both pollinators and people and all the rest of it. And you're basically creating ecology. So um, in terms of those mulberries, in terms of what you're seeing, um, I would try to incorporate them into your design. They obviously want to be there. And I think our job as permaculture designers, regenerative land designers, is to do more of that, is to see what wants to be there and to encourage it to grow, to be these assemblers that put together these ecologies that actively want to grow themselves, that we don't spend a lot of time nurturing. I really appreciate uh, Mark Shepard's sheer, total, utter neglect, the stun technique, sheer, total, utter neglect. Um, there's a couple of things he gets fantastically right in his books. There's a couple of things that in terms of what P.A. Yeomans put out and what he puts out is very different, which is why it's good to read both. Um, he also copied the name of um, P.A. Yeoman's book, um, Water for Any Farm. It was Water for Every Farm. A couple of conversations there. But I really appreciate tons of what he applies and what he does. And this idea of what wants to survive on its own. Your land is showing you that. It's going, here's what wants to grow. Do you like to eat it? <laughs> because here's, here's what wants to grow. And so I think that's an important piece to play. And I love that this will be... Um, looking at the time, this will be our final question over this conversation, because that's really our job over time is to go, what actively just wants to grow here and how can we nurture it along instead of, I want uh, uh, Pippin's orange cox apple, which is like this penul penultimate apple. I, I think I'm even saying it wrong. But we need to be conscientious about this whole idea of human over nature. And one of the both benefits and downfall of permaculture is we can design a better future it's why so many engineers come into permaculture but a lot of that mentality is how we got here a lot of that we can design a better future got us into our predicament and so the other side of it the like let's be observational let's do what's here let's work with what's available has to be married with that we can design a better future to well, let's be observational long thoughtful protracted thought was the very first permaculture conversation um, in this course and in other books and in the pdm permaculture designers manual so be observational first and foremost base your designs on what you observe don't force function something onto the landscape because it's a good idea allow your design to come out of what you see Take a look at the first frequency of zones. Take a look at the microclimate zones. Take a look at what the client wants and see you know, what that overlap is. Is it easy? No. Thinking holistically has been bred out of humanity. It's been enculturated out of humanity. It's been trained out of humanity. We're, we're easily trained if we're monocropped beings from focus and attention. But if we expand out and really think holistically, contextually, our effect can be exponential and our, that exponential effect can be positive. It doesn't have to be negative. We can be just as positive as we are negative. And that's that wonderful Jeff Lawton quote, which I love so much. So work with your mulberries, work with those plants you're seeing, work with the volunteers. They're volunteering. Fantastic. Let them volunteer, let them make the food you want. And from there, you know, develop and cultivate yourself, which goes back to Masanobu Fukuoka, agriculture is not the perfection of the landscape, but the cultivation and perfection of the person. It's about us becoming, again, a part of the ecology that we've stepped so far away from. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Very much. Thank you. Uh, you're so welcome. All right, folks, we we have come to the end of at least the office hours. We're about to come to the end of the course. And there's a couple of things to impart. Um, first and foremost, all assignments, 9 a.m. next Monday. That's it. If you want to resubmit other assignments for regrading, next Monday, 9 a.m. That's, that's our last moment. Um, 
I love staying in touch with students. I love hearing what everyone's going on with and what's happening. So please do reach out with what's happening in the future. If you want to keep in touch, allpointsdesign.ca, bottom of the page, that's the newsletter. Uh, new educational offerings. It's mostly educational offerings. I have to be better about like sharing all the cool things that I see. Uh, if you want to be aware of, of different tools and resources, um, feel free to follow me on Facebook. It's Jam Bernakovich on Facebook. Best to follow versus friend because I'm at my limit. Um, and I tend to post generally everything that uh, I'm seeing. Like I just posted a great resource all about uh, an amazing database that shows all the different root sizes and depths and things of that nature. Should I get another social media account? Sure. Is this the one I use? Yes. Is Meta a terrible company? Probably. That's what I'm using. Um, when you are stepping out into the next conversation of whatever you decide to do and you're in the permaculture designers pro class and so the majority of you are probably wanting to do this in some level for design for application i cannot stress enough having more time to work having more projects to work applying yourself in repetition consistently there's a great conversation that the only thing that is born fruit on our planet is compound interest, compound interest in terms of natural intelligence, of genetic breeding, of, of financial conversations. But that's such a lesser conversation when we take a look at the total intelligence and stock and resource that the planet is. So applying yourself consistently over time. And I say this because I recently had cause to uh, go back to my CV and I've been pretty good at keeping up with all of my educational efforts but I never really made the efforts to keep track of all the designs I've done. And May 25th, 14 years ago, so this is four days and 14 years ago, I left what was my conventional track. I was either gonna become a uh, pastry chef, which I had a partial scholarship for. I was gonna go back working with the Alberta government, taking tours into the Badlands and showing petroglyphs. I was gonna work in the North, or the South, again, with Alberta Parks. Or I could say nuts to all of you, I had four or five job offers. And basically, I went back to school. I went and took a natural building course at OUR Eco Village. took my first PDC and jumped into this for 14 years. And as I was doing this, this CV, I was like, ah, maybe I got 25 designs. I had 71 designs over the last 14 years, and I've remembered five more since last week when I finally wrote them all down. And it's remarkable what you can do if you just continually put yourself out there and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Hey, will you put this design in if I design it for free or for cheap? Um, hey, I want to organize a perma blitz. Hey, I want to host a movie night. And as I was looking at all of this body of work I have now, I have consistently been involved in outreach and that outreach has consistently brought work to me. So hosting permaculture nights, hosting potlucks and movies, hosting potlucks and presentations. Um, we did a Pecha Kucha permaculture night, uh, 20 slides, 20 seconds. Um, Gord Baird, who is uh, uh, one of the instructors who works with Regenerative Living, uh, I still remember it. I'm pretty sure I still have the, the, the slides. It was permaculture pornography. It was basically just homestead photos, but it was how he got everybody's attention. He brought everybody to the conversation. Um, so never underestimate um, what you can do in a year. This We have this conversation, we overestimate what we can do in a day and we underestimate what we can do a year. And I would further that out to say, we underestimate what we can do in five, 10, and obviously 14 years. As long as we continually have a vision that's bigger than ourselves, that we can never achieve. And this is really important. And this is why values-based decision-making has been the most important tool in my toolbox, is that if we focus on the values we want to inhabit, Everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis will constantly bring that to be true, and we'll never we'll never do that plateau. We'll never do that thing that people do when they say, "I want a house and kids," and I got a house and kids, and they're like, "What else is there to life?" And they have this little mini life crisis. Instead, when you have values like, "I want to allow my essence to be expressed," that's a never-ending positive feedback loop that consistently allows you to buy into the idea that your expression is actually one of the most important things in the world. And why people then buy hats like this for you, because all you do over your lifetime is change and evolve. So I'm very pleased to have you all as colleagues after this course, because you'll all be within that PDC club. 
Uh, I hope you don't stop designing and exploring and sharing and working with outreach because we can work in a multitude of ways. It's not just designing, it's hosting conversations. I hope you continue to reach out. I hope to see you in another class, either with OSU or Generative Living. And if I can do anything to help you out, either formally or informally, generally I'll give anybody 20 minutes. Uh, if you've got a little question or a comment or working on design, and if you need more help, we can definitely arrange that and, and contract what we need. But uh, it's been a great pleasure to walk through the course with you. It's been a great pleasure to host these office hours with you. You guys have been one of my favorite groups and uh, it's just been really fun. If I would, I would make us t-shirts and send them all to you around the world and we could wear them during our reunions, which I've never had, but I think it's probably a good idea at some point. So thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, as somebody reminded me, I used to have a, uh, a signature line in my emails and I used to say this during classes and I just stopped, but I think I'll say it now. Uh, be fruitful and mulch apply. And we'll <laughs> see you in the next couple of years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. Thank you. Javin, yes. I have a signature and it's called From Poverty to Prosperity, Passionate About Permaculture. Now, you know, it puts me in a box of permaculture, but I've seen poverty and moved to prosperity. And uh, yeah, and Thank you for me. This has been incredible. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. That's a wonderful saying. I love that. And, you know, by hook or by crook, use every tool you can. Permaculture is a great <laughs> tool. Just don't deify it. Don't make it the everything. Just keep keep the viewpoint open. Use all the tools in your toolbox and have an open mind, but not so open that your head falls out. <laughs> <laughs> See you, everybody. You. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.